is Terry Babcock Lumish. I serve as the Executive Secretary of the Truman Foundation and CEO of Friends of Truman. As a reminder, Friends is the nonprofit partner of the Truman Foundation, America's Living Memorial to President Truman, and our National Monument to Public Service. We all know all too well our democracy is no spectator sport. So it's inspiring that we, we shattered our previous record for Truman scholarship applications this selection season. And just last evening, we wrapped our finalist interviews with remarkable young leaders we've been meeting from throughout our country. They are working on everything from national security to the climate crisis, public health, education, and many, many more issues that are um, very timely and relevant. Uh, in 2021. Thank you. As I know, many of you who are joining us today have actually been inspiring and mentoring uh, members of this next generation of leaders in service. So please keep your eyes peeled for an announcement of our 2021 Truman Scholars next week, April 14th. Today, however, uh, on this anniversary of the January 6th attacks on the U.S. Capitol building, we're turning our attention to more seasoned leaders in public service. Like many throughout our country, I was deeply troubled by the events that unfolded here in DC three months ago today, uh, but inspired at the very same time uh, by those who stepped up to defend our democratic institutions and one another. This includes many of our own Truman scholars, both elected officials and Hill staff, whether today or in years past, the Capitol building's hallowed halls are, are home to many in our community. And so we are really pleased to join forces with the University of Chicago Project on Security and Threats to explore their research surrounding political violence and domestic terrorism. I sincerely wish Professor Bob Pape's research weren't so timely and relevant, but here we are. Led by our very own 1980 Pennsylvania Truman Scholar, CPOST founder Professor Pape is a world-renowned political scientist specializing in political violence, social media propaganda, and terrorism. You have his and our other esteemed panelists bios, so I'm not gonna read them in full or it would easily take up our hour together. Uh, joining Professor Pape are just two wonderful and familiar names, Secretary Jay Johnson and Professor Bob Pipe Putnam. Very briefly, Jay Johnson served as our nation's fourth Secretary of Homeland Security, stepping into the shoes of our own 1977 New Mexico Truman Scholar, Janet Napolitano. Created in response to the 9-11 attacks, DHS is our third largest department of the US government, responsible for counterterrorism, cybersecurity, aviation, border, port, and maritime security. And then Professor Bob Putnam uh, is the Harvard Malcolm Research Professor of Public Policy. He is a prolific author of 15 books. Many of us know him well from Bowling Alone and Making Democracy Work, uh, some of the most cited books in the social sciences. But today I'm keen to put on your radar his latest book entitled The Upswing, How America Came Together a Century Ago and How We Can Do It Again. We're gonna begin today's program before we get into our conversation with a short video. because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. Today was a dark day in the history of the United States Capitol. Looking a mob of his supporters, President Trump upended America's long tradition of peacefully transferring power. Our help! Our help! Our help! If the crowd pushes past police anywhere along here, they'll have easier access to the building. In the crucial first hour of the attack, the mob stormed through the Capitol, at times coming within feet of lawmakers or Vice President Pence. You can see Vice President Pence and his family quickly move down the stairs. He's got a gun! He's got a gun! The adult woman who we reported was in critical condition earlier today, she has now been pronounced dead. What we are dealing with is not merely a mix of right-wing militia groups, but a broad mass movement with violence at its core. At CPOST, we have conducted three studies with a research team of three PhDs and 20 graduate and undergraduate researchers. We have evidence that this is fundamentally a political movement and one that's not rooted merely in the reddest parts of America. Further, the three studies that we have conducted have all converged on a single driver 
It's called the great replacement. The great replacement is the idea that minority rights are outpacing the rights of whites in America. Who were the insurrectionists on January 6th? First, let's look at how the Capitol Hill insurrectionists are similar to past right-wing extremists. They're similar in two ways. Those who were arrested for the Capitol Hill assault on January 6th are 94% white and 84% male. This is very similar to past individuals arrested by the FBI for deadly violence over the last few years in the United States where 94% are white and 94% are male. But that's where the similarities stop. Two thirds of the Capitol Hill insurrectionists are over the age of 35. Many are in their 40s and 50s. This is very different than what we normally see with right-wing extremists where two-thirds are under the age of 35. Only 9% are unemployed. That compares to what we normally find with right-wing extremists where 25%, sometimes even more, are unemployed. 12% were CEOs or business owners. 31% were from white collar occupations. This is extremely different than we normally see with right-wing extremists. In fact, in our past studies of right-wing extremists, we don't normally have a category for business owner because they're so rare. The insurrectionists on January 6th have a different demographic profile compared to past right-wing extremists. 39 individuals of the 324 arrested came from militia groups. Compare the January 6th insurrectionists to past right-wing extremists, 88% of the insurrectionists are not affiliated with pre-existing militias and gangs. This is very different than what we've normally seen with right-wing violent extremists, where typically half are associated with violent militia groups or gangs. The vast majority of the January 6th insurrectionists have no connection to existing far-right militia groups. Normal pro-Trump activists joined with far-right militia groups to form a new kind of mass movement. The January 6th insurrectionists came from 42 of the 50 states, large numbers from California, large numbers from New York. And if you look at the middle part of the country, zero. 52% of the insurrectionists came from counties that Biden won, while 48% came from counties that Trump won. These are all pro-Trump individuals from large urban areas where there are majority Biden voters and it's the minority in those areas that are sending the insurrectionists. The most important factor about the counties sent the insurrectionists for every 1% decrease in the non-Hispanic white population over the last five years, that increased the odds of sending at least one insurrectionist nearly five times. And this finding holds even when we control for a variety of factors further, this finding Finding would happen by chance less than five times out of 100. Now let's look at Texas as an example. 28 of the insurrectionists came from Texas. They're concentrated, though, in some very specific parts of Texas. This slide shows you the counties that were won by Biden and by Trump overlaid on the insurrectionist data. And what you can see is that the vast number of insurrectionists are coming from counties that Biden won, not from the reddest parts of Texas. Now overlay the demographic data. What we see is that the vast number of insurrectionists came from counties that have lost the most white population over the last five years. 
This is strong confirmation that what's occurring in the January 6th insurrection is in response to the fear of the Great Replacement. Court documents and also other documents which record why they went to the Capitol on January 6th. Dozens and dozens of individuals give just one answer, President Trump. They say over and over again that the reason they came to Washington, D.C. on January 6th was in response to President Trump's request that they come. They say over and over again that the reason they marched on the Capitol was in response to President Trump's speech. For example, Robert Bauer of Kentucky marched to the U.S. Capitol because President Trump said to do so. Jacob Chansley of Arizona said he was in Washington as part of a group effort with other patriots from Arizona at the request of President Trump. And Jennifer Ryan of Texas said she entered the rotunda because he said, be there. And so I went and I answered the call of my president. Storming the U.S. Capitol was an act of collective political violence inspired by a leader, President Trump and not merely vandalism or trespassing for other purposes. Now let's turn to our second study, estimating the drivers and the potential size of the insurrectionist movement today. We surveyed 1,000 American adults on March 13th and 14th. This is not just a nationally representative sample, but a probability sample randomly sampling within that representative sample, the gold standard among polling agencies. This also allowed us to have a fairly impressive confidence interval where our results are accurate within a range of plus or minus one and a third percent. The key research question that we asked was, what factors drive the difference between those who believe the 2020 election was stolen and are willing to engage in a violent protest and those who do not believe the election was stolen or who do believe the election was stolen but are unwilling to engage in violence? 4% of all American adults believe the election was stolen and say they would participate in a violent protest. That equates to 10 million Americans. Another 74 million Americans believe the election was stolen, but say they would not engage in a violent protest, at least as of now. We need to be worried that those 74 million, at least some of them, may change their mind and become willing to engage in a violent protest. What are the drivers that make someone more likely to be in the 4% than in the other parts of America? There are only two risk factors which are statistically significant, belief in the great replacement and being on social media for over seven hours a day. These two factors, are strongly correlated with being in the 4%. We can break down the 4% and see that this equates to 3.6 million white males, 3 million white male gun owners, 400,000 white male veterans, and 360,000 white male veteran gun owners. So that the mobilization range goes from the low end of about 360,000 to a high end of 3.6 million. This mobilization potential doesn't mean that the individuals have congealed into a movement, but what the potential tells us, if it were to congeal, it would be a very large problem. I'm not predicting civil war, but we need to take seriously this large mobilization potential as it relates to a significant rise in lone wolf terrorism against minorities and a replay of stolen election violence in the upcoming primaries and midterms in 2022. Our third study found that the replacement fear was again the most important driver of pushing people into the category of believing both that the 2020 election was stolen and being willing to participate in a violent protest. We also found some support for a broad-based QAnon belief. We found no support for economic anxiety, 
This is the fear that the individual would lose their primary source of income. Military experience actually dampened the likelihood of being in the steel and violent category, although the 6% is still a worrisome number because of the skill set that that 6% brings with it. Belief in the imminent coming of the Messiah during the person's lifetime also dampened the odds of being in the steel and violent category. Overall, the fears of the great replacement is a consistent factor across all three of these very different studies. In our first study, the odds of sending an insurrectionist is four times higher in counties where 1% of the non-Hispanic white population has declined. In our second study, among all Americans, believing that Blacks and Hispanics are overtaking white rights increases the odds of being in the insurrectionist movement threefold. In our third study, among conservative Americans, fear that Blacks and Hispanics will have more rights than whites increases the odds of being in the insurrectionist movement twofold. The fact that three different studies comes to a consistent conclusion is extremely striking and means that we should have moderately high confidence that the great replacement idea is a core driver of this new mass movement. All the ingredients are there to accelerate the growth of this movement. It has a leader with a modicum of legitimacy, President Trump, and a leader with demonstrated support for extra legal activity. There are grievances and fears perceived by millions of people. There is now a deadly focal point event in January 6th itself, which is going down in the folklore of this movement as a new Independence Day. Going forward, we need to build on the current success of law enforcement in their important job of arresting the Capitol Hill insurrectionists. We also need to thicken our understanding of the movement and develop more viable solutions long before the 2022 midterms. We also need to recognize a very real danger of a new focal point producing new mobilizing narratives that could further bleed into vulnerable publics and congeal violence in the near term. What are our next steps? We need to conduct monthly and expanded nationally representative surveys starting in April and all the way through the November 2022 midterms. We need to create a panel of policy practitioners and academic experts to assess the findings and develop viable policy initiatives. We also need to work in close conjunction with the U.S. government to accelerate our understanding and response. And most importantly, we need to act now. If I can turn first to Secretary Johnson, some sobering thoughts there. I, I'm just wondering, um, what did you take away from that massive amount of information, Secretary? First, good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me. I look forward to this very, very important discussion. One of the reasons I agreed to do this after speaking to Bob Pape was, um, life has a way of coming full circle. It was 100 years ago that my grandfather studied at the University of Chicago and got a PhD in sociology. And while he was at the University of Chicago, he studied the 1919 Chicago race riot and made some interesting findings from that. Uh, Bob's study is frightening. There are three things that stick out to me. One, fear of the great replacement. Two, social media. And three, 10 million people. 10 million people, if you accept the assumptions in the survey, are prone to doing something similar to what we saw on January 6th. I appreciate the clarity of 
the study and it lays blame on essentially two things for what happened on January 6th and would could and could recur which is uh, the fear of the great replacement and social media well, let's talk about that for a minute because of social media, Americans are allowed basically to believe what they want to believe. They are allowed to go to things that are supposed sources of news and information that do nothing more than reaffirm our own biases, our own prejudices, our own suspicions, and our own insecurities. And so I believe that we need to continue to probe in this very sensitive, important, and dangerous area and undertake to answer some really hard questions about the state of our nation. As I see it, January 6th was um, made apparent that our country is becoming more divided. Uh, the divisions, the racism, the resentment in this country has become more pronounced in large part because over the last four years, we had a president who validated much of the suspicions, the paranoias and, and the prejudices. So it's more overt now. We see it out in the open now. But, uh, and in many respects, we're, 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 we're heading backwards. The, the, the thing that, and I'll stop in a minute, but the, the, the image on January 6th that the two images that most frightened me, that were the most appalling to me, was one a hangman's noose constructed on the Eastern Front, on the Western Front of the US Capitol, and a Confederate flag parading through the halls of our US Congress. Never even during the Civil War did we see a Confederate flag being paraded through the US Congress. But here we are in the year 2021 with such an event. And the time is now to begin to address the current environment. And I really do appreciate Bob's good work here. And I hope that it gets much, much, much broader exposure beyond this point. Thank you, Secretary. Tell me, um, what, what sort of use could a Secretary of Homeland Security or National Security Advisor make of this sort of information? I think they can make a lot of use of this um, because it targets the problem. It isolates the problem and makes and brings clarity to the underlying forces at work here. And if I were secretary of DHS, and believe me, there are a lot of reasons why I'm very happy I'm not secretary of DHS anymore. But if I were secretary of DHS, I would use this study to go to Congress to make sure that we had adequate resources and funding to address you know, things like um, the prejudice and the paranoia that exist in certain communities. There are organizations already that exist, and one in, in Chicago, for example, that we can talk about that addresses life after hate and uh, helps pe pulls people away from violent white nationalism. This is not simply a law enforcement problem. Uh, there is a need to address the problem before it becomes a law enforcement problem. There should be aggressive, the FBI needs to continue to be aggressive in this area, but there, there are a lot of things that I think our government at the federal, state, and local level can do uh, to really uh, focus on this. The problem with funding is it tends to take time. There, there is a process that you have to go to. Uh, Professor Pape is talking about research that needs to be done now in order yep. to understand uh, before, the, um, before the elections next year. So it, is it possible to speed up that funding or are we, or are we bound yes. by the systems already? Yes, I was pleased to see that the current secretary of DHS conditioned DHS's grant-making activity, which goes to state and local law enforcement, on the requirement that a certain percentage of that go to addressing white nationalism. 
And not a lot of people know this, but DHS every year um, grants hundreds of millions of dollars, probably in the billions by now, to local law enforcement, to programs that include programs that address eradicating hate and to programs that are not strictly law enforcement. And so there can simply be a re-emphasis and a redirection based upon the current threat environment. And those grants and the direction of the grants don't necessarily require approval from Congress. It's a year by year assessment of the threat environment and where we think the money should go. I wonder, Professor Pike also talked about uh, academia and, and government working together. Presumably it does that already, but could that relationship be improved? Yes, it can be, it should be. Um, I had an academic advisory committee when I was secretary. I don't believe the prior administration, uh, the last one rather, uh, made much use of it and allowed it to die in atrophy. But um, very definitely, we should at the national level, at the federal government level, be encouraging more, more research like what we just saw. Before I move on to uh, Professor Putnam, I just wonder, is there anything else you think you should add at this point? Uh, I, uh, yes. Um, I, we need to find a way to encourage the American people to reward political courage in this current environment, not punish it, not censor it. You should not be censored by your local Republican committee for exercising political courage in Washington. Um, politicians right now are incentivized simply to play to their base and to say outrageous things like, it wasn't really white nationalism, it was Antifa, or I never really felt like I was under threat. There was no real threat. Uh, they were hugging and kissing the police officers on Capitol Hill. And a lot of people buy that crap. And the, the American voter needs to punish politicians they elect who tell lies. Right now, that doesn't happen. And so I, we, need, we need to re-incentivize bad and good behavior among our elected officials. That brings us rather nicely to uh, Professor Putnam. Professor Putnam, thank you for your time. Um, in your book, The Upswing, you talk about the need to move towards that sort of change. Where is America at the moment, in, in your view? Sorry, Professor, you're on mute. First of all, thanks very much for um, inviting me to take part in this uh, conference It's a and, and this discussion. It's an extremely important topic. I can maybe say a little bit later about why I think this is such an important um, topic. Um, uh, the upswing takes a much longer view about these issues of polariza political polarization and link them to inequality and, and to social uh, decay of various forms. Um, it's a look over a 125 period, year period. And it, one thing that it shows is that these problems of polarization and for that matter, violence, um, did not begin when Donald Trump entered the White House, did not begin, they began decades before Donald Trump entered the White House, and they will not leave after Trump is gone. Um, and, and that doesn't mean we don't have to deal with things in the short run, and, and I'm very interested in that and want to talk about that in, 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 in the context of Bob Pape's um, work. Uh, but I do think it's important for those of us who are at least analysts and maybe for everybody in the country to understand this is not just about Donald Trump and fixing, so fixing the Trump problem will not make this go away. It has much deeper historical uh, roots. Now, of course, I'm the focus here is on the shorter term. That is what's happened recently, really very recently. And I'm, and I learned a lot from uh, Bob Pape's studies, by the way, I prefer to be called Bob too. Um, when, when people 
uh, when I get a phone call asking for Robert, I know they're trying to sell me something because anybody who actually knows me would never call me Robert. Um, so let me say some of the things that I learned from the study. Um, it's, it, what, let me say, a, I had been thinking about this issue of, a, of the, the far radical right as potential source of violence. <clears throat> and I had said and even written that I thought the order of magnitude might be 1% of the American population. Probably less than 1% is what I said. But the fact that Bob suggests now that it's 4% is essentially an order of magnitude bigger than I at least. I don't know what other people's estimates were. An order of magnitude bigger. That's the 10 million figure, roughly speaking, that Secretary Johnson spoke about. That is if that's even approximately true, that's a really big deal. Um, and it can't be handled. It, of course, requires um, a lot of work by our intelligence agencies, especially the FBI. But it becomes a much bigger task. And therefore, a high priority is to begin to pin down how accurate is that 4% is that figure. And Bob's, Bob Pape has already begun to do that by saying, well, okay, let's focus it specifically on, you know, people who um, have guns and a military background and so on. Nevertheless, it's a, it's clearly a big deal. And the study, to my mind, establishes that pretty clearly. Another thing I like about Bob Pape's study, and I'm concentrating really on most, more, more on the, on sort of the academic dimensions, the scientific dimensions of the project rather than the policy implications. I'm happy to talk about the latter too, but my area of specialization is really the more um, social science part of this uh, project. And there, I believe, it, I like the fact that it is a, a multi-method study. That is, it doesn't focus on a single method. That's a really important principle of social science, fundamental principle of social science. Um, now, if you ask me my professional judgment about the methods of the particular of any one of these studies, there'd be things to discuss. I've told Bob that I'm more persuaded by some of his studies than others. And, and um, this is not the time to go through, you know, that the, the nuts and bolts of specific preliminary findings. Anyhow, Bob describes them as preliminary findings, and I agree that they are. And, and you know, the way research goes is sometimes it'll turn out that your first guesses, your first impressions are right, and sometimes it'll turn out they're not right. And I expect that to be true. Um, what, but even now, I think I see one central um, finding coming out of this research that I am persuaded by. That will that will stand the test of time and repetition. I mean, uh, replication and and so on, and that is context matters. So let me say what I mean by that. Um, I think there's a lot of evidence here, especially in the part of the study that I the third the study that I like best, which is the NORC Public Opinion Survey. I think that's a very powerful study. It's uh, Bob is right. That's a very high high quality survey data. All the usual, I mean, I do the old survey data all the time and all the usual objections that one would make about survey data are, don't apply to this. It's very high quality. Um, and one of the things that comes out of that, I think, is the importance of context, by which I mean either the cultural context in which, out of which uh, violence emerges. Um, like, for example, the this is the, that's the way I would describe the the, the factor called the great fear. Uh, is that, have I got the right title? The, 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 uh, the fact that large, in large parts of America, large numbers of people have this, large numbers of white folks have this fear of the great replacement. Um, or it could be organizational um, uh, context that's relevant. Not, not the, the QAnon or Proud Boys organizational, but other organizational channels. I think that's consistent too with some of the initial findings. Now, why is that? That in itself is a very important finding. I don't, and I'm going to try now, I'm not a policymaker, but I'm going to try now to speak from the point of view of policymakers, why discovering context is important. It sounds like academic blah, blah, blah. But what it says is an individual level approach, trying to understand who the terrorists or the insurrectionists are by only looking at their personal characteristics is inadequate. And yet that's a, that's a normal way people would go about trying to say this. So, so who are these insurrectionists? 
But we know, let's, we know, Bob has already shown that one individual level approach just doesn't help us. And that is the standard thing that everybody expects if you look at an individual level is that um, insurrectionists are likely to be young, male, um, alienated discontents. And his research shows beyond doubt to my mind that this is, that's just not true for most of these people. Of course, there are some people like that, but for the most part, that individualistic approach doesn't help you in identifying who the people are and therefore figuring out how strategies for combating it. But in a more subtle way, Bob's other finding, which is that it's lots of ordinary people, it's, it's middle-aged, um, middle-class um, men and women. Um, and, and that you would think, well, that does help us narrow it down, but it doesn't because by far the majority of middle-aged, middle-class men and women aren't gonna be insurrectionists. So even knowing that that's the characteristic, it tells you who isn't, but it doesn't tell you where to go looking. If you you've told the FBI, well, go looking for middle-aged, middle-class um, uh, men and women, that that's where you're gonna find them. That is zero help. That describes, you know, half the US population. What you need is more contextual in, information about and I'm trying to put myself in the position of the people who used to work for Jay Johnson and the, and the other intelligence agencies. You need to go need to go looking in particular contexts, places where either there's culturally a cultural context that is where exactly are the the act the activists the insurrectionists where are they getting from what cultural context are they getting this um, you know disease in a way. Or and or from what organizational context are they getting it? And I have to say, and Bob and I've had some discussions about this, it seems to me at least possible that some of the evidence points in the direction of Republican Party organization being a part of this. I do not mean that, please don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying that local county chairmen across the country, Republican county chairmen are leading this movement. I don't mean that at all. But I mean the latent organizations, the net, the latent networks um, that are concentrated among Republicans um, look to me like they're, the evidence look the evidence suggests to me that that context that organizational context in combination with the cultural context that is this fear of of, um, of the, the great replacement um, is is where to look well look I've now gotten in way down into the in methodological details and I don't want to carry us further there, but I, what I do want to say is this, from a research point of view, this is what good research looks like at an early stage. A lot, way more questions than answers. And, um, and frankly, way more, it needs way more involvement by a range of empirical researchers. I mean, it also needs involvement by a lot of practitioners too, but I'm speaking from the point of view of, of a social scientist, Bob needs to gather a, a, a range of views from a lot of other social scientists. That's the way social science works. And that's what he's planning. So the one thing I wanna say in conclusion is it seems to me, A, this is really an important topic um, and, and a bigger topic, frankly, than I had thought when Bob first approached me about this issue. That's the 4% versus you know, less than 1% issue that what, what Jay Johnson referred to as the 10 million issue that catches my attention. And B, I think Bob is right as to the next steps. It's very urgent. It needs funding. Frankly, it needs government funding. That's the only kind that's going to come up in size and in size enough. And it means a framework within which Bob can benefit from the council of, of other social scientists like me, maybe not me, but by other social scientists and by practitioners like, like Secretary Johnson and other people like that. Well, hopefully it will be people like you, Professor Putnam. Um, I, I think your book should be required reading for anyone looking at this problem because it does give you that broad historical look um, at what has gone on in America o o over the past, you know, decades and decades and decades. Uh, just before we, we cut to the audience, I'm just gonna give um, Bob a chance, um, Professor Paper chance, just to any thoughts on, on what the secretary and what Professor Putnam has had to say. 
Uh, just to build immediately, I think Bob Putnam is exactly right that we need to look more into the deeper roots um, in inequality. We should understand that what may be happening here is not so much a material decline um, in the 4% as a loss of status problem, which could be rooted in fundamental inequality. Now that, of course, we have some terrific people in the country who study this. Uh, we don't need to reinvent wheels. We need to marry them together. Um, also, Bob puts his finger on organization. Well, we know that there are catalytic issues that we want to look at, but it's not simply militant group catalytic issues. Right. Bob's putting his finger on other types of organizational catalytic issues, exactly what you would expect. So I study political violence all around the world. These are exactly what we do in all around the world. We're just not really bringing those ideas here where we need them now, but we can. We, it's not like we have to reinvent these wheels. I also think Secretary Johnson here has really um, highlighted important ways, one that we can really move quickly on this. This is a, a problem that we are within our grasp to do something about. Um, and we don't need to wait three years to sort of study it. Um, and number two, it's important that, as Secretary Johnson said, we need to engage. So what DHS and can help us with is engaging mayors. This is, we need to engage at multiple levels of our government. This is, um, it's important to, yes, um, talk to the FBI, which, we're, which I'm doing. It's important to talk to people in the Biden administration. It's important. To, it's also important to talk to mayors because they too are likely to contribute to some creative policy solutions. Um, and there are other nonprofit organizations in major cities already poised to contribute. We have pieces here, uh, folks. Um, we have a potential problem that if this really got going, man, we, we would be hard pressed to we want to respond now. We want to do the serious work to thicken our understanding and to build these bridges with, uh, within academe, policy practitioners, and government. And now is the time to act. That's excellent. Well, Secretary, Professor Putnam and um, Professor Pape, thank you. I'm, I'm going to jump out now and hand back to uh, Dr. Babcock Blumish to field some of the questions from the audience. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thank you, gentlemen, for this discussion. Really appreciate your helping us better understand the, the political and the social landscape, including both the threats and opportunities facing our country today. And Secretary Johnson, really appreciate your thoughtful remarks on re-incentivizing uh, political courage, for sure. We have a number of questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can in the next 10 minutes. Um, first one from our 2010 uh, Truman Scholar, a veteran of the Coast Guard, Melissa McCafferty, asks, it, um, let's see, she asked, I'm concerned at the alarming rate of veterans engaging in this space. What can I do? What can we do to encourage this? Are there any specific actions you'd recommend? First of all, um, oh, thank you. First of all, um, I was the civilian oversight for the Coast Guard and my own son is in the Coast Guard. He's a proud member of the Coast Guard. So I appreciate getting a question from a Coast Guard veteran. Um, so that's a very good question. I just want to go back to something Professor Putnam said before I answer the question. First, um, we refer to January 6th uh, sometimes as an insurrection, sometimes as an act of terrorism. I'm going to put my lawyer hat on for a moment here. Broadly speaking, what happened on January 6th probably fits the definition of terrorism. And, you know, that it certainly catches people's attention to refer to it that way, the severity of it. It is, however, the very definition of an armed insurrection. Uh, that's really what it was. It fits the definition of terrorism, but it's a very definition of an armed insurrection. Um, the other point I'd like to make is that is, is, is what the professor said. This is not new. Um, and it, it comes down to an issue of race. And this is not new. You look at the images of January 6th, to me, they are virtually identical to the black and white images of angry people, a mob beating freedom riders in the 60s or spitting on school children, trying to integrate the school system in, in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957. It's the same. The, the, the question we need to ask ourselves is the question I heard the historian John Meacham ask. 
not too long ago, which is how did George Wallace's 13% in 1968 grow to 47% in 2020? I believe the answer is because we've allowed it to become more pronounced. And once it becomes more pronounced, it's no longer under the rock, it becomes a highly contagious virus. And that's what we face right now. And that's why I think Bob's 10 million number is something more people need to hear. Now, the US military, in my experience, as the general counsel of the Department of the Air Force, the general counsel of the whole Department of Defense, and as a civilian oversight for the US Coast Guard, the over, over, overwhelming majority of our men and women who wear the uniform of our nation are, are true patriots who love this country and would never have engaged in something like what we saw on January 6th. Still, there is a strand of right-wing extremism, I am sure, that exists within our military. And the military culture is perhaps the most equipped to deal with it. Um, you know, take the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps is highly susceptible to command influence. They think what the commandant thinks. So if the commandant issues a statement deploring violent extremism, um, violent extremism will end in the Marine Corps, I guarantee it. And so, you know, we need our four-star leaders to go to work on this and to demonstrate and, and communicate uh, that this is the type of behavior that uh, is not allowed to exist in their army, their Air Force, their Marine Corps, their Navy, their Coast Guard. I think the answer is not much more complicated than that. And thank you for the question. Go ahead, Bob. Um, in our NORC study, we have some information that bears directly on this, Secretary Johnson uh, and, and everybody, uh, which is that being in the military, military service dampens the odds you would be in the 4%. And we can show that systematically, and it's far greater than chance. However, it doesn't eliminate the odds. And it helps us to further identify the pool. And that pool that's remainder, the residual that still is in the 4%, are lethally, they are the, the professionals in lethal violence. So it's very important. The kind of study you just saw with Nork has many other findings that bear on other parts of our government. And this is why we need to engage social science. So we have some other good questions here, but I can't help but wonder, given that we have you with us, uh, Professor Putnam, we have historically thought of our military as that opportunity for people from diverse backgrounds, diverse parts of the country, diverse experiences coming together. Um, we have less than 1% of our military, or excuse me, rather of the American public serving in what is now an all volunteer military. We'd just love to hear your thoughts on this. And if you could unmute. Um, look, um, I have long been an advocate of something like a draft, actually, for that very reason. Now, of course, we don't need, um, well, this is not, we're not in you know, World War II, so we don't need a, the full, um, we, we probably we need a tenth of, or maybe less than a tenth of the, any given age category. But in, I'm very strongly in favor of national service that is whether um, military service or other forms of civilian service, like the Peace Corps, for example, or like the domestic Peace Corps, all those sorts of things. Um, and I am for two reasons. Let's, let's imagine um, I spend much of my time up in New Hampshire. There's a, uh, a domestic Peace Corps um, uh, camp that's I can see from my home because it's on the mountain across the, across the pond. Um, now think of those kids. Um, Partly what they're doing, of course, is clearing the, path, the trail so that I can walk up to the top of Mount Monadic more easily. That's the least important thing they're doing. The most important thing they're doing is they're learning citizen skills. I mean that very concretely. They're learning how to discuss, and, and then they're getting explicit training in citizenship nowadays, and they're meeting people of a different sort. Of a different sort nowadays, the people in those groups are meeting people of a different economic background, a different racial background, a different gender, 
a different political background. It's in jargon, it's what we would call bridging social capital, that is connections that link us to people unlike ourselves. So I'm, I'm trying not to get so far away from the que question you ask, which is what about the role that the military has played historically? Obviously, sort of since, since uh, Truman's actions at the end of World War II, the military has been a leading institution and it's certainly stayed on the forefront of addressing issues of racial uh, integration. It's not perfect, but it's better than almost any other institution in America. Um, and so my question is, well, we're not gonna have another draft, but are there things, and we're not gonna get everybody in the military for goodness sakes, but are there things that we could do in the civilian sector that would replicate the, the good consequences of that? And I think national service, and I have to say, I don't wanna be too partisan here, but the fact that in the um, uh, American Rescue Plan, the, the first $1.9 trillion, a million dollar, um, or trillion dollar um, package that the Biden administration put together, they've invested a, a billion dollars in national service training. And that's a terrifically good investment. I mean, it's really a wonderful investment. And it's, it's not been in the past a partisan thing. That's what's really frustrating about this. In the past, there have been as many Republicans as Democrats who thought that national service was a good idea. Sadly, in this polarized world, that, that support on the Republican side has vanished. I will at least use this as an opportunity to share the recently introduced Civic Secures Democracy Act of 2021 is both bicameral and bipartisan, and um, it is it is heartening for sure. You know, we don't have much time left, and there's so many thoughtful questions I'd love to delve into, but I do think Richard Cantor's question is worth uh, perhaps uh, taking us out on. Would love to hear all your thoughts. What strategies can we employ to promote and encourage the public to reward political courage? I think that is kind of the, the million dollar question we have. Secretary Johnson, as you put that one on the table, would you like to take it first? Well, it, it seems sort of basic and simple to me. First, if you're an elected official, you're entrusted with a lot of things. If you lie to the voters, the voters ought to punish you by, not, by voting you out of office. If you lie, that's, that ought to be rather basic. Or if you, if, how about if you commit a federal crime while you're in office, you ought to be voted out. Uh, I'm not so sure that would happen anymore, uh, simply because the, the, the person who's accused of a federal crime could say, ah, fake news, I didn't do it. She, didn't, she doesn't exist. And because voters are allowed to believe what they want to believe, or they are, they are able, they're, they're told certain things and without a whole lot of scrutiny, are, are sim just simply accept what they're what they're told, and so I, I, it starts with the voters. I believe it starts with the voters. Yeah. Um, if voters reward political courage and condemn acts of political weakness, uh, condemn acts of pandering, then the politicians will respond accordingly because they're politicians. So. I think it's as simple as that. Can I jump in just quickly to say, I completely agree with that. And that's true in this broader historical context of the, the in the, I'm not trying to sell my book, but the, the, the upswing talks about that. There's a debate among political scientists, is, is polarization uh, top led or bottom led? And I think as I look at the evidence, it's mostly bottom led. That's my jargon for saying, I think that Secretary Johnson is right, that in the end, it's a, it's a chicken and egg, but in the end, the big blame here has gotta be put on our citizens for not demanding that their government work together. And that's because American citizens have become so individualistic and so unconcerned about the general welfare. Um, uh, it's, it's a much longer discussion and we don't have time for that. But I want to put the accent on exactly the same syllable that Jay Johnson did. If our people demanded greater um, seriousness on the part of our politicians, it wouldn't require courage. It would just be doing the right thing would be the same thing as doing what would get them elected. That's why I put the blame primarily on citizens. Can I it, just to add to that, and this is something that's been an overhang for this entire discussion. January 6th and the strand of people prone to January 6th, which Bob talks about, 
that's not political. It's not a political problem. This is not politics, it's cultural, but politicians have decided to ride that horse and, right. and pander to that strand of America. So this is not, it's not, it's not Republican or Democrat. I actually think it's unfair to, you know, hang this on the Republican party as somehow an extreme version of Republicanism. There's no part of what the mob did on January 6th that you could identify as part of a Republican platform, frankly. Uh, and I say that as a partisan Democrat, but the problem is too many politicians have chosen to pander to that group and do whatever it takes to pander to that group. No, really appreciate it. These are critical points. Um, Professor Pace, anything else you want to add before um, I think everyone? I just, There's so much more we could cover here if we had a whole nother hour. I just want to say that what January 6th tells us is that our great American democracy is in danger of losing the line. And what we have done today are the first steps toward holding the line. We need to understand the problem. We need to have broad-based understanding and then go even further. That's where these creative solutions are going to come from. The idea we're just gonna pull them out of our hip pocket and solve this big of a problem here, that's not the approach. But what we've done today is we've taken meaningful steps toward a much better future for American democracy. No, that's absolutely right. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Pate, the entire CPOS team, Secretary Johnson, Professor Putnam. This is a critically important conversation. And, and the reality is this is just the start of an ongoing conversation, ideally moving beyond uh, dialogue to action. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I know we didn't get to all of the questions, but the, the, hopefully this is the, the start of an ongoing conversation for all involved. Um, We'll be convening our next Speaking with Friends event on April 22nd. This is a discussion of disability policy and advocacy vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19. And again, as a reminder, our announcement is we are um, announcing new Truman Scholars from each state plus the territories when it comes to stitching together community and ensuring we are, we are not bowling alone. Uh, I think you'll be inspired <laughs> by uh, this next cohort that we'll be announcing next Wednesday. So with that, Thank you everyone, take good care. This concludes today's program. <laughs>